Welcome everybody. I think we are ready to start. Uh, my name is Marco Komatz. I'm uh, the current uh, president of European Federation of Geologists and I warmly welcome you in the name of the Federation, in the name of our presenter, and in the name of the excellent team that has put together to today's the fir first webinar that EFG is hosting. Uh, since this is the first webinar, I do kindly ask you to forgive us for all our fl flaws and mistakes. Uh, I know that there will be very little of them, but if they occur, please uh, be, uh, be uh, sensible, okay? So now I invite everybody to board the plane, to take their seats and enjoy the nice presentation it's going to be given by Carlos Garcia Arroyo, and he's going to present the topic of learn geology, fly with the European Federation of Geologists. It's a very symbolical um, title for the first webinar. And who is Carlos? Carlos is the vice president of uh, the Spanish Association of Professional Geologists, and he's the president of the Spanish NGO world geologist. He is very experienced pilot also in addition to being a geologist. So that's a really interesting combination as you will see later on. He studied geology as I already mentioned. And then after his study uh, studies, he worked in the, uh, in the oil industry mainly in Spain, Morocco, Oman, United Arab Emirates, but he also flew elsewhere around the world, as you will see. His flying career is over 20 years um, old. And he also flew for Iberia, which is the, um, the um, Spanish flying company for uh, transporting the citizens. So he didn't only uh, fly the the, or the remote sensing uh, planes for geology. And what makes him a perfect uh, combination is that he joined his passion for geology with his passion for flying. And we will see some very impressive images from his presentation. The presentation is gonna be roughly half an hour, a little bit more long. And after that, you will, uh, Carlos will answer your questions if you might have them. So please put them in the chat and my colleagues, the background technical stuff that you don't see, but they are very important for this uh, webinar, will collect them and send them to Carlos to respond. So thank you for letting me do this introduction. And now, Carlos, please start up the engines you can take off the plane to a interesting um, adventure that you prepared for us. Thank you very much. To all of you, I wish happy holidays and all the best in the new years. Enjoy the flight. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, control copy, we shall be flying very soon as soon as we finish. So good afternoon and welcome to our flight of geologist 1512 with destination geology. We will fly at an altitude of 41,000 feet, nearly equivalent to 13,000 meters, with an average speed of 1,100 kilometers per hour. As we may see, we shall be departing Madrid flying north across Spain, going to the Alps. To see the Alps over there, then turning left, heading east, into the east coast of the United States. We shall be entering by the Labrador Sea, all along the coast, down to the Mississippi Delta, across the Florida Strait into Bahamas. Then all around South America, passing by the Amazonian Basin, having a look at the reliefs in the zone of Brazil by Sao Paulo, and all around the Alps after crossing it. Once again, we'll cross and then we'll go by a Cabo Verde into Mauritania and back to Spain. The estimated flight time, it'll be 35 minutes. So I hope you have a pleasant flight and thank you for flying with the European Federation of Geologists. 
Radiologist 1512 is clear for takeoff. So we are now starting our flight. Our flight starts as soon as we take off. So we have the lift off and starting our flight. And this Airbus 34 600 series, the aircraft that had been flying for my last period as a pilot. As soon as we fly, we may see here in the north of Madrid, uh, La Pedriza, which is in the National Park of Guadarrama, is a battlefield. It's a battlefield of a granitic stock which has been formed during the Arsenian orogeny. And those folds were then reactivated during the Alpine orogeny. It's a granitoid massive which is intensively fractured. Here you may see the fractures. And these fractures are reactivated, as I said, during the alpine orogeny. What we may see here back is a reddish coloration that we have in these domes of the plutonic intrusions, which is due to the oxidation of the iron minerals in the granitoids. As we may see here on the map on the right, we have the Duero Basin in the north and the Tajos here in the right hand corner. And what we have in here is a pop-up structure, is a compression from north to south, that it's popping out all these elements, which are the granites, having hinterland basin as those that we have in here, and blaze basins, and you may see here, the thrust direction and how it's being propagating from north to south. Two myofolds are affecting this area, which is the Mesejana fold, according to our Portuguese colleagues, we know in Spain as the Placencia dike, and it runs from the center of Spain down to the southwest of Portugal by Cabo San Vicente, is a long fold. And here we have another peculiar fold, which is the Lerradon. Here we have a view of the Lerradon fold, which is here depicted, and this implies all this process, as I said and I mentioned, is a shortening due to thin skin tectonic processes. What we call here in Spain locally is a block tectonics. All these fractures has been dividing these great blocks of granite into these orthogonal and peculiar geometries. This is what we have in here in the center of Spain. We are climbing and as soon as we climb to pass the central system, we see the remnant of the glaciers. What we can see here, that the glaciers, here we have the moraines, here you have them, and here on the right, a map of the moraines. The glaciers in this zone of the National Park reached a maximum extent in Peñalara at about 30,000 years ago, and it reached a maximum thickness of 100 meters. By then, the average temperature was nine degrees lower. It is thought that the Neardentals inhabited the Spanish Peninsula, and the Homo sapiens decorated the rooms in the Altamira cave in Spain, which is quite famous. So it was too cold, so you had they have to be covered. On the other hand, we have the significant retreat of the glaciers. We may see here how the glaciers retreat, and they are leaving the moraines in different stages. So it took the Holocene the following period. We have the one before last, the last and the period of retreat, which is near the summit, as we may see here. Then the climate had completely changed and the annual average temperature has already been similar to the current. That was during the Holocene and uh, now what we have is, as I said, a dissimilar temperature that does not um, protect the ice from being there any longer as it was during the Holocene 30,000 years ago. Here on the right, you have the map, which has been made by Hugo de Maya and Juan Garandel in 1917. Flying west, we go to the Gredos Circ, as you may see here, the morphology of this area related to the glacial morphology and on both a slope on the left that we may see the lateral moraines which are left when the ice melted. The ice tend to leave a U-shaped valley 
which is a bobbin into a BC valley passing from glacial into fluviatile environment. We are approaching the Pyrenees and we shall be approaching the Pyrenees. We have here in the picture on the left, the Gavani Thirk and the Gavani Folds. Here you may have a succession of anticline, syncline, and it also is reflecting the tectonic evolution of the origin. We have here aniformal stacks. You may see them, how they are piling up. And here you have some folds which had been enhanced by the snow in contrast with the rock. That's what we have in here. The main thrust on the Pyrenees in this area lies along this line. And here we have three interesting valleys. One is the Valle de Ordesa, which is a national park. We have Cañón de Añisclo and Valle de Pineta. Here is the Monte Perdido, one of the highest summit in Spain. On the right, we may see the process of compression that took place since the Paleocene to the Oligocene and how the thrust, the Gavarni thrust, which is in here, and then follows the Monte Perdido, which is in there. So we have two thrusts in here and they've been piling up. And what we see in the front is the recumbent faults, which are in this area. Notably, you may notice as I mentioned here on the faults. We continue our flight and we are arriving to Switzerland. We have here on the left, the Eiger. The Eiger, there was a challenge in snow phase for climbings in the last century. Here they have. And also what we have here on the right is the Alitz Glacier, as is in Germany, Alitz Glitzener. And this is the largest glacier in the Alps. It's about 23 kilometers long and it has a volume of 15 cubic kilometers. It covers a huge area of 31 kilometers. And uh, it goes on the Bernese Alps in the Swiss canton of Balais down to the Rhone Valley. What we have in here at the Concordia Plate is at least three glaciers that meet, meet together. It has been measured by geological surveys and geologists. The depth in there, which is still in some places up to one kilometer in there in these zones. As I said, it continues the Glacier Valley into the Rhone Valley and then is giving birth to the Massa. The less glacier, as well as the glaciers, is somehow retreating, has been affected by the global warming and the global heating that we're having in this anthropocene, as they call, or this anthropic behavior that we are having and suffering some of the fast. We are conscious of this. And uh, it has been stretching some time. It, it's been uh, the length decreasing by 3.2 kilometers since 1870. And also the thickness that we mentioned at about one kilometer, it was 1,300 meters. So it has decreased in 300 meters. We shall be now crossing the Atlantic on the Great Circle navigation. We follow the autodromic route in our flight from Madrid to Mexico. Somebody may think, why don't you go straight? So let me tell you that the shortest distance, it is the orthodromic course from the Greek ortho, that means right angle, straight, and dromic, which is a path. It's a, a practice of navigation for an aircraft along a great circle. Such routes give us the shortest distance between the two points in the globe. Approaching 40 west, we will see some cloud development of cumulonimbus with an ambil shaped cumulonimbus in here, which is developing as it is heating and warming up uh, as the day passes. What we see here as well is in the line which is here depicted is the interface in between the tropo troposphere and the stratosphere and this is the tropopause which is the top of the clouds what we see normally when we cross in the Atlantic. As we may see we have another quite uh, curious event of precipitation which is called Virga.
which is the name given to the precipitation, usually rain, that evaporates or sublimes before it hits the ground. So it is either passing by a hotter area or a hotter layer of air, or it evaporates because it's too dry. It tends to look like a wispy gray strikes hanging underneath the base of the cloud. We're crossing the Atlantic, we're approaching the Labrador Sea, and we may see the ice flows. Ice flows moving south during the spring describe a particular circular patterns of eddies on the embayments on the coast. Here we may see from the Labrador Sea how they are coming down. This is on detail. And this goes southwards towards the East Atlantic coast. We get into Canada and we see how the glacier has been eroding the crater in Canada. You may see that the situations and also the wind direction coming from the west that can be observed here. On the stop sides, the snow tend to accumulate. We continue our fly down to south and we are going to see Long Island next to New York. What we hear here that the longitudinal coast and currents and the transport of sediments to the south form the Long Island. And they include sediments from the remains of the abandoned moraines. At the end of the Wisconsinian, our Laurentide glaciation, those blocks that were left in here are mobilized by long shore currents. We may see the same as we've seen in Peñalara when we flew over the Central Massif and the National Park of Guadalajara, a certain number of moraines which are left in here. We have the Ronconcoma moraine, we have the Pointarian moraine, also Boyog moraine, and all of them. So the ice retreats, and that's what is left of the ice when it's melting and leaving these kind of deposits that is going to be mobilized by the Lonsar currents. What we see here, well, is as I mentioned, we have a long shore current. And also what we have in here is the sediment transport moving like that, then is displacing towards the south and tend to accumulate towards the jetty. That jetty is protected the entry of the New York Harbor. When we get down south and we approach uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, we may see the delta. The delta, the interaction between the sediment laden fluvial waters that come into here, into the sea, and basin processes at the mouth of the river, that defines a delta. The delta is affected either by the river discharge, by waves, or by tides. We may see here on the right, on the main channel, some prograding areas. And here we see the pattern described on these sedimentological processes. We are crossing the Strait of Florida, going into Bahamas, and we are going to believe flying Bahamas from the northwest into the direction, from the, from the northeast into the southwest. We shall be crossing by uh, Berry Islands. We shall see Julter Ski, Andros Island, Great Bahama Bank, and we be going out by the Bimini Archipelago. Yeah, what we have is the first that we see what we are flying east, and it's Berry Island. Berry Island. The Bahamas were first discovered by Columbus in 1492 and settled by the English in 1648. And uh, the name Bahamas comes from the Spanish name Bajamar, Bajamar Losi. And it is in, refer in reference to the low sea and shallow sea that we have in here. You may see that in the lagoon. But more likely it represents the name Wanahanani, whose origin had been lost and whose meaning has been uh, forgotten. What I may deduce that there is not phonetically equivalent sound between the letter J in Spanish and English. For the letter J, we have juez, judge, they have ham and we had jamon. 
So there is an equivalent sound, but it's not the same letter H than J. What we have here is a shawl. You may see the shawl, which is uh, shaped by the action of currents, waves, and predominant winds. This is a shawl, as you may see here, with this festoon pattern, which is made of grainy facies of the allocams of the carbonate environment. We have now here Jolterski, which is a process of a tidal currents getting in and out through channels. And we have alien processes that had been somehow eroding this island, this key. And you may see here some lenticular shape pattern of erosion that left this dune originally that was standing on that beach. So the dune remains are in here, as you may see the morphology that have the dune when it's advancing towards the lagoon. We have here Banco Fulitic Grainstone, which are migrating west into the Great Bahama Bank, a picture in detail of this. These sands are mainly made of olitics and ooids. What we have in here of the tidal flood is the muddy and channelized olitic faces and a network of tidal channels, as you may see in here. Here on the right, when the channels are at the mouth of the sea, what you have is a bird foot tidal delta. Here you may have a look at it, quite clearly shown in the picture. And it is prograding down slope, seems to be grabbing the slope. The tidal mars in Andersilos, we may see the two different zones, supertidal and subtidal, different color due to the amount of chlorophyll required by the vegetation. That one is some time of the day cover, so there's not a huge amount of chlorophyll for the photogenetic function. The pristine blue color in there, and what we have in here, it is a very intriguing and an enigma, which is called the whitings. The whitings are these areas of milky white water, which are seen better from the air. And those elongate patches are to a hundred tenths of meters long. They lie on floating over the Grey Bahama Bank. These are dense suspension of aragonite needles. In the origin, the aragonite mud is arguable. It may be the accumulation of needles by the composition of uh, Codiacians and the Cicadacians uh, algae living in the, in the, in the Great Bahama Pan, and somehow it's been enhanced by the bacterial processes. Also, somebody think that those are shoal fees steering the bottom. And also some geochemical explanation may suggest that these are direct precipitation of whitings appear suddenly as a result of the CO2 up take during diatom blossom. Well, still is an enigma and many discussions about it still are arising. The lithic sand gave a sand wave, which is nice in the north of the Great Bahama Bank, as you may see this shape it has that has been somehow been modeled by the action of the tides and waves. We may ask why in a lagoon environment, as we have in Bahama, in the Great Bahama Bank, why don't we have salt? Obviously, when the air masses coming from the Atlantic enters in the archipelago, they rise like convection and they have sudden discharges. These are then diluting the salts that may concentrate in these areas of the lagoon. We shall be leaving Bahama by the east, and we have the sand waves due to tidal action, which are mainly of oolites and oids on the Bimini archipelago. There is an unconformity that has been discovered while drilling in some areas in the archipelago that reveals that 120,000 years ago, the land surface here underneath was at the shallow depth but on surface. It was during the uh, latest uh, Pleistocene continental glaciation. So as the sea level drop, 
that was then exposed and has been dated on the sediment of this unconformity. We are flying south now and we are entering the Amazon basin. Here we go where the meeting of the rivers happen, meeting the Black River here at the bottom, at the Amazon River, Solimo is known as the bottom, the Brazilian people know. This phenomenon, as you may see here, is due to the difference between the temperature and both rivers, the rate of discharge, and the amount of sediment which is carried by the water. This differs. That Black River is nearly sediment free and it is colored by the decayed left and plant matter that comes from the basin upwards. The Amazon light colored water is rich with uh, clay sediments that they are coming from the basins in the, in the Andean mountains. There is another interesting thing related to the Black River. Black River and the Amazon basin is connected with the um, Orinoco Basin by a Caño Casiquare, a Quasiquare Canal, that it was a river capture linking both basins. It was discovered by Spanish prize and then navigated by Alexander von Humboldt, the explorer, the German explorer. What we have in here relating to the bed load transport, we have longitudinal bars, here on the left, and bank attached bars in curved channels. We have them in the inside and in the outside. They are showing the characteristics of a point bar. And uh, we have here some crossing channels affecting them. We have the meandering morphology here, which has been developed, and some channels, as I say, dissecting it. We may have a point bar also, which is going to be developed, here in the inside of the turn of the, of, the, of the channel. What we have in here is the meandering morphology and the Oxbow lakes that appear on the Amazon basin. Here we have an, an abandoned meander. Here we have an Oxbow lake. Here you have it. And they have a process in which one side connects into the other. The outer side of a canal, of the outer side of a um, river bed, it's eroded because it has more erosion as the speed in the outside of the town is higher than inside. So it is eroding outside and depositing in the inside. In the inside is developing what it is known as a point bar deposit, as a point bar deposit. You may see the growing patterns in here, which is dissected by channels. As it grows, it is then displaced. And as I mentioned, one side catches the other and produces a neck cutoff, or what we have in here is a chat cutoff. The two kinds of bean cutting the river. We have some channels which are connecting the upstream meanders with the downstream meanders, and these are called abulsion channels. We are approaching Rio and we can see here the dramatic steep side mountains, the result of collaborative forces. What we have here is a magmatic and metamorphosed granite that it has an intrusion and it's been formed underground and then has been exposed since a long time and it will give us the morphology which is typical and we can see in Rio de Janeiro all the sugar and all those mountains which are typically there, which is the Sugarloaf Mountain. We are approaching the Andes and we shall be crossing the Andes from the northeast to the southwest here as depicted on the chart. What we're going to see here is a plan view with a geology and related to the Aconcaguan front thrust belt. Here we have it, this is the section D. So we shall be crossing from there into there. We may see the Nazca plate, which is a subduction zone, goes underneath. We go magmatic and volcanic processes, thrusting system. We go hinterland basins, foreland basins. And then here we go the salt pans in the east side of the Andes. We go crossing now, down over the Andes, and we may see up there the sand and here the shadow sun of the night. 
In the background, we may see a Bali, that kind of Bali as we've seen in the Gredos and remember in the glacial morphology, it's a U-shaped Bali evolving into a V-shaped Bali, passing from glacial into fluvial processes. Quite interesting when we see that is the mineralogical processes and have been taking place in the Andes due to the fractures on the thrust fronts and in many fractures caused by the subduction on the upper crust. What we have in here is um, iron oxides. So we have a yellow limonite, we have red hematite and a black goetite. Iron oxides, these iron oxides as the goetite changes into hematite by oxidation. And these are of uh, hydrothermal in origin. What we have also here is iron oxide in the Aconcawan front thrust belts. You may see here this band of iron in La Laguna del Pelado in the west side of the Aconcagua mountain. Another kind of minerals which is famous Chile for, which is quite a big producer of uh, copper, which is the azurite and malachite as we are having here. Atherite is unstable in open air compared to uh, malachite. And the weathering process is the same picture in uh, two different days. Uh, it causes the replacement of the carbon dioxide of these carbonates and, and by units of water. And, and this is changing the duration. It is then easily altered as you may see here. We are crossing the Andes and next to Santiago, we may see this open pit and here, so you may observe in there. And what we have inside the hinterland valleys in the foreland basins, what we have brighter rivers that tend to be running along the, the origin. We have here an alluvial event, which is an alluvial fan. And also, this is the distal part of an alluvial fund. And you may say here, the triangular shape that has been originated by the process of erosion. As it erodes, it forms this triangular shape. As you said, the braid of the river. And also what we have here is an entrenched river in a tectonically active zone, which is so in an unconformity. So you may have a look at here. And it is between these alluvial fund deposits and the uh, steeply dipping towards the left formation that lies underneath. This is the tonically active system. As I mentioned, the triangular shape, that means the lifting and erosion of the alluvial funds, giving the pattern of form, which is a triangular shape on the distal zone of the alluvial fun. What we have here is a faulting process on the, as I say, the hinterland basin and the foreland basins affecting the alluvial funds. You may see here the alluvial loops, fairly well depicted in here, and a fall running along in a north-south direction. Having a look in detail in this fold, and probably enhanced by this patch of snow in there, you may see which is a industrial motion that is taking uh, place in there. See that part, the upper part of this is moving towards the right, whereas the one on the left, it's moving, to, sorry, the one to, under, underneath it, below it, is moving towards the left. Some folding processes, the same alluvial farm we've seen in the last picture. Here we may see how this zone is completely folded and we may see this fold in detail and which is also fractured here in this area. We may see more folds in here and it has a direction of the axis mainly north-south, the same as the origin. And also here we have a nodal fold, which is an anticline in Ishiwalasto is a Triassic sandstone, what we have in here. Following this process, we have exhumation processes, which are so in the folds. You may see here the erosion caused by the river, 
of the erosion caused by fluvial environment and that giving you know a clear view of how the fault is in here of this ionic line you may follow the ionic line in here what we have in here is then the Aconcagua you may see the Aconcagua the Tupungato and Cordon de la Ramada here you may see some faults affecting here you may see the massive and an old glacier running along this place. This is a vulcanite from the Triassic age. What we have in here is an avalanche. Occasionally we may see some avalanches. You may see that one, which has been a recent fall of snow and it has caused this avalanche. And also what we have here on the east side of the Andes, we have uh, the salt pans. We have the evaporites in a salt pond, as you may see here, and one small lake in detail here, which is the same as we're having on the left. What well, we have, and we got to think that in the Central Andean Cordillera, we have an Indian province, which is 500 square kilometers in extension. It is huge, probably one of the biggest again in British provinces in, 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 the, in the world. The origin and evolution and mineral resources of these salares or salpan, salares as it's known in Argentina, are related to volcanism, close basin, and endorheic zones. Uh, it has no drainage at all. And we have obviously an arid climate. So the precipitation tends to occur on the Chilean side. So the water discharge does not tend to be happening in the Argentinian side of the Andes. That's why it is then so arid. We continue our flight and we encroach in the Maipo. Maipo is a stratal volcano in the Andes, lining the border between the Argentina and Chile. And it is inside a caldera, Caldera del Diamante. And here we got the Laguna del Diamante. The lake was formed when lava blocks that were formed, they closed the drainage of the caldera. That was in 1826. We are flying north in the Andes. We are going to be refueling in Quito. And here we have in the background the Cotopaxi. That day we had the chance to fly from Quito to Guayaquil and we may fly keeping in contact with the terrain a close view of the Cotopaxi with the Chimborazo in the background. Here we have the Cotopaxi with the Chimborazo on the background. And close to the summit of the Cotopaxi is the glacier placed in the summit. And those crevices in here are giving some avalanches sometimes due to the seracs, the block of ice, which are falling um, downslope. That's another one in here, which is the Cayambe. It is in the north of uh, Ecuador. And the popular belief, and what we're gonna mention now is related to Alexander von Humboldt, uh, ensures that it was the German naturalist, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, the one who coined uh, the, the, the avenue of the volcanoes. There is a huge long, uh, part of uh, the Andean in the equatorial zone which is nearly 300 kilometers in the Rintiandra Valley and hosts several of the 98, including active volcanics and inactive, that they are in the, in the Ecuadorian land. The Ecuador is a volcanic land in one of the 15 countries which is most actively in, in the volcanic processes now. Here we have the Quicocha Lake, and here we may have some threat of volcanic eruptions. So as the water get in contact with the magma coming out. One day in Guatemala, I had the chance to see the lava. I went to the Pacaya volcano and I get close to 1000 degrees isotherm, which is quite hot, sweating here, but, but quite deeply. We are crossing the Atlantic passing by Pico do Fogo which is the Fogo volcano in the Fogo Island in Cabo Verde. It's nearly 3,000 above sea level and it's an Arctic volcano. 
it, it erupted later in 1680 and it caused a mass uh, emigration from the island. But about 70,000 years ago, a mega tsunami, notice that the huge boulders of uh, scattered uh, blocks of lava in the island of Santiago, which is next to Fogo, were lifted up to 220 meters from the sea level where it was and 650 meters away from the from the from the coastline some of them they were within more than 700 tons and it is profusely uh, published by uh, the portuguese um, uh, team of volcanologists that have been working in the santiago island what it happened is that uh, probably probably the trade winds coming from the northeast in this area, as we may see here, have a continuous discharge of water since the lava and the volcanic materials, sorry, are so porous, they got hydrostatically load and then it produced a huge landslide producing then a mega tsunami that displaced the blocks on the next island of Santiago. We see the Aeolian archipelago in the south of Italy with volcanic activity. And we may see here the degassing processes. And we're going to be crossing now Africa, entering from Dakar and leaving from Agadir into Madrid. We shall be crossing this curious geology we're going to see here. What we have in here is a Mesozoic to recent sedimentary cover, the Mauritanids, which is a Bariscan belt, a period of one and terrain, the West African craton, in where we have Paleothic sedimentary cover, the Regibat Sild. We will see some dikes and a swarm of dikes and shields in here. And then crossing Tindut Basin and anti islands into Madrid. Here is related the mineral ores, which are related to those significant features and uh, the formations that we are going to be passing. Copper, we have also gold, we have iron. The Senegal River, Senegal River um, tends to be going at, out of the, to the sea in this area, but the longitudinal current and the sediment transport has blocked the mouth and it has to turn around describing this meander a few kilometers down south then it founds its mouth and goes to the sea another thing is here is the alluvial fan that we may have over the craton here we have a cambrian limestones and an alluvial fan related to this zone which has been probably draining the drainage of this zone has transported the sediment down to here and it may happen 6,000 years ago during the Saharan pluvian events when the Sahara was wet. An unconformity we may see here where we fly north between the Cambrian limestones and the Mauritanids. Yeah, we may see them, which are steeply dipping towards the left, and that one, which is a flat line limestone. We found here it's um, Fuerat, Fuerat, which is placed in the north of Mauritania, which is in the, in the border with the West African Crescent. The deposits occur here in the Archean and Beremian Regibat Seal. We are now in the Regibat Seal. And it's an open pit and the mining of uh, hematite ore and they use rotary drills, small shovels and trucks. And they use a train to move this, 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 these minerals to Nuaribu. We may have this here, the view of the, of the mine. Up north, we continue and we find the folded Regibat seal, which is paleoproterophoic. You may see here, has it been folded? And we have some faults. Here you may notice the displacements on the beds. And it's completely, completely eroded. It's as flat as a table. You may see that in here on the Regibat Seal. We continue our flight north and that craton 
has been uh, fractured. And uh, we have here an intrusion of um, um, materials, which are tholaitic basalts. And they've been dated by uh, uranium lead, by the layout and the age provided by this geochemistry test give us uh, 1.38 billion years, 1,380 million years, which is in the Craton. Here you may see the pattern also of the alluvial funds, which are linked with the seal and the dike, which is in, in here. We continue to fly north. We see the folded on the eyes of Ordovician and Silurian material. In the Tindu Basin, we see the salt ponds. This is a barrier to the water. And here we got the wadis running along the craton, which is on the right. We reach Agadir, Agadir at Plutan Decline, which is in here on the South Atlas Fault next to it. And uh, remember that Agadir had a earthquake in uh, 1960 that cost 2,000 casualties. It destroyed completely the city. And there is a fault coming from there that affects mainly the, the city. Well, we're going to start our descent. We shall be landing in about five minutes. The weather is good. It's time of reflection. Time to find the light to remember our lost ones. This is the past president of our institution, Alberto Garrido. He used to fly helicopters at the beginning of the 60th last century. He flew over the Pyrenees and taking pictures black and white. That has to be developed. No digital sources as we have today. And they, he used to interpret them by using a coda thrust paper, a transparent paper on top of it to plot the thrust system, to plot the faults and the cocktail between the liars. Thank you, Garrido, for being a pioneer. We're in short final. And now our geology is 1512 Clearland. Roger Clearland, Madrid runway 36 right. We're approaching a finger, we're approaching the end of this flight. I hope you have enjoyed this flight. Let me wish you in the name of the European Federation and all of us in this tough time, let me wish you quite sincerely health and strength. And uh, united we stand here, the geology awaits. And united, all will get out of this. Thank you very much for your attention.